Hello and welcome to Premier GT, where today I'm joined by Mike McCann uh, from our finance partners, Elevate Finance, where today we're hopefully going to try and clear up some of the muddy waters when it comes to car finance. Uh, Mike, welcome back to Premier GT Show. It's great to see you. <laughs> great to be back, David, yeah. yeah. Um, really really, really just, good to be back. Maybe we can start with, uh, you can talk us through uh, a bit of background of Elevate Finance and what Elevate Finance is all about. Yeah, Elevate, basically we are a finance brokerage. Um, we were rebranded in November 2000. 2017. Um, we work with ultimately supercar dealers um, like yourself across the UK um, as well as the, the, the clientele um, that you deal with that we, we tend to uh, sort of deal with directly. Um, we work with a pretty extensive panel of, of funders uh, which opens itself up to again your clients to ensure that they get the best possible deal depending on what their requirements are. Um, I've worked with uh, Elevate since uh, 2012. Um, my background is very much sort of working for finance houses, so I've got experience of working as, as an underwriter in years gone by. Um, so we've got a sort of pretty good handle on what the lenders um, are looking for in what is very much a, uh, a moving market. Mm. Well, we've been with you now as Premier GT for, I think, around about five years. Um, the benefits for, for us as a dealer um, is that um, you guys have constantly got your fingers on the pulse. And as a broker, as opposed to us going to direct to a bank and having an affiliation with them, is that you've got the whole market open to you. So yeah. you can go out for our clients and see what the best deals are out there uh, for them, the best options. You talk to them direct for us. So we can basically almost pass our clients over to you when it comes to finance and you can advise them what yeah. is yeah. best for their needs. Yeah. Um, and, and the proof is in the pudding. You know, we, we, we have wonderful reviews everywhere and our customers, the feedback we get from them from talking to you, they yeah. find it very comfortable, as you say, to be taken out of the car showroom and, and talk to someone who's a professional who can guide them and help them through to get in the finance package they want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Sort of bear in mind, obviously, what we've gone through with the COVID thing. I just worked out, I think it's been two years um, since I was last down in the showroom to, uh, yeah. uh, to see you, which has obviously been a difficult time. Um, but proof of the pudding is definitely when you, when you have a look around the showroom, you can't fail to be impressed with the stock that you've got. Because if I think, if I go back sort of five years ago, six yeah. years ago when we first started dealing with you guys, I think you're probably a, a bit of a level, level under, yeah. uh, if you don't mind me saying, but now sort of every car in here is a, is a supercar. Yeah. I think we need to move on to questions there, because I've got a funny feeling you're just trying to soften me up, and then you're going to sort of hit me with a uh, uh, really difficult question. We'll try and be as gentle as we can. It's the, uh, you can blame the guys at Formark, the members there, they're yeah. the ones that sent most of the questions over. Yeah, but yeah. hopefully we will clear up some uh, muddy walls when it comes to finance. Yeah. So Mike, first question, why do so many people take finance on their vehicles as opposed to buying a car cash? Two parts I would say to this. First part is uh, the funding at the moment is, is cheap um, with the banks uh, as far as the interest rates that are available um, mm. with the, the panel of lenders um, that we deal with. Um, and the second uh, sort of area um, that, uh, that I would say is when a customer is able to keep the, a lot of the cash in the bank, it can actually change that customer uh, from being potentially historically aspirational to then these, these supercars actually being truly achievable uh, by way of putting in a sort of 10 to 20 percent deposit. Um, maybe if you felt that you could afford a car that was 100 grand, that car that's maybe 300 grand is not sort of um, unattainable, if, if that makes sense. And I think that's part of the reason yeah. why finance is so popular. So it's making cars more affordable and also leaving you cash in the bank to invest in other areas, home improvements, anything you might want to do. Exactly, exactly David. Okay. Cash is king. Yeah, exactly that. So Mike, with regards to uh, funding limits, what is the minimum and maximum that Elevate Finance will do? So minimum balance we would consider is 15 grand. Um, and ultimately we don't have any ceiling um, on, on what the maximum is. Main rationale is it takes my guys just as long to, to basically process a, a deal for 15 grand as it does on, on a million pound deal. Um, and, and realistically, that's the area of the market that um, we sort of uh, want to sort of continue to, uh, mm. to grow in. Um, as an example, um, of the 50 Maserati MC12s that were built, we've been involved in funding four of them. Wow. Um, so again, that, that, that's the area of the market that, that we want to be in as opposed yeah. to... Uh, so so the minimum people. caps there, because you, as Elevate Finance, are really specialising in this market. So Correct. you've got your niche to give the clients, your clients and yeah, yeah. our clients the best, yeah, yeah. Exa the best uh, options they could have yeah, for, yeah. for their financing by by just capitalising on one area? 100%, okay. yeah. yeah, yeah. So 
So what about age, for example? So we've got uh, an SLS here, a Mercedes SLS, very special car, one of my favourites, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, the car's 10 years old, and on normal finance circumstances, that would be uh, considered uh, too old to finance. Yeah. yeah so yeah. how do Red Eight Finance deal with uh, appreciation assets such as the SLS? This probably is a really good example um, to use at the moment because it's a, a sort of ultimately a modern day classic. Uh, so the view that um, we would have had with lenders in the past that maybe doesn't fit their typical criteria that the car's got to be no older than 10 years of age um, when it finishes the agreement, if there's a balloon rental um, there. Because these cars have, have really appreciated over the last sort of um, five years, the lender now are, are sort of uh, taken more of a, of a view on uh, on these that the asset is obviously very very solid because it, mm -hmm. it, it's appreciating the client that we deal with your type of customer um, is is a strong strong client so they're sort of now moving towards um, funding more of these cars and again it just gives us a bit of an advantage where you're dealing with with more than one funder. Okay. So Mike, obviously I know the answer to this question, having dealt with Elevate Finance for five years, but can you tell um, our, our watchers, um, what are the advantages of doing finance for a broker other than going direct to a lender? First and foremost is, is the products that we can offer. Because when you're dealing with one lender, um, ultimately they've got their, their own products, whereas if you're, you're dealing with uh, effectively six lenders, um, which probably six lenders we would give a uh, a sort of tranche of business to each month. That gives me access to a lot of different products so I can mix and match um, dependent on what the uh, customer's requirements are. From a scorecard perspective as well, obviously we, the, the, there is certain credit scores that certain clients have that might not necessarily fit with, uh, with one lender. So one lender might sort of uh, take a view that um, it's not a particularly uh, strong customer as far as agreeing a lend, whereas another lender could sort of take, take a different view. A lot of the customers that we tend to deal with tend to um, be company directors uh, and how company directors pay themselves when it comes to dividends. income, dividends. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, it can be a little bit sort of complex and again how we put that across to um, a lender to uh, to take a view, one lender could take a different view to um, to another lender. So that's, that's, that's the benefit of dealing with a broker. Okay. So in, in short, you're able to look at the client and you know what lender is best to place them with. Yeah, yeah. And to give them, obviously, uh, the best finest package to suit their needs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, um, yeah. And where if you go to direct to a lender, you're stuck with their parameters and well, there's no variety. There's, yeah, I, I think ultimately the conversation that tends to go on with, with, with the customer as well, if, you, if you've got a dealership that's dealing with one lender, they'll maybe fill in an application form, send it through to that, that, that lender. What we do when we're talking to a customer is we, we'll do a little bit like a phone interview, yeah. and we will go into detail on, on dividends, um, annual income, any additional investment income that a customer um, is getting to just basically put together a, a bigger picture because ultimately what the lenders are looking for is affordability and serviceability, yeah. which, which, which we've got to demonstrate. So uh, off the back of that lender, you know, is, the back of that information, you know exactly what lender do you want to correct. Uh, be placing them with that yes. suit their needs best. Okay. Yeah. So we've all heard about negative equity and we've heard of people that have got themselves into negative equity when buying these cars. Mm. Can you explain to us how to, what negative equity is and how best ways to avoid it? As far as the, the things that impact on uh, negative equity, first thing is the deposit that a customer puts in. Um, second thing is the interest rate that the customer's charged. Uh, third thing is the type of product that the customer takes. So in certain instances, if it's a non-regulated agreement, the exit penalties on a non-regulated agreement could be particularly high. Mm -hmm. Again, the onus is then on the broker to make the customer aware what those uh, what those exit penalties uh, what those exit penalties are. So deposit, interest rate, and the product that you're taking. And um, what about balloon? People going for the balloon payments. Uh, we've often had customers that have come in here and they, they've, they've come in and they want a minimum deposit and they want the biggest balloon they could get because that's what they've been offered elsewhere to try and get their monthly payments down to a minimum. How could that affect them halfway through or towards the end of the agreement? I, th I think, again, what we try to do when we're talking to the lenders is we, we will look at what these cars have changed hands for historically uh, and try and steer the lender as far as giving a fair residual. Numerous times I'm, I have customers saying to me that balloon is far too low, but the, the reality is 
it may seem far too low because they're trying to get to a, an aspirational payment, but we, we've got to sort of um, err on the side of caution because ultimately we've got and a lender that we're trying to... And it's putting them in a better position exactly. halfway through or to yeah, the yeah. end of the agreement. So yeah. the key things to avoid here, or the key things to look out for here to stay away from negative equity is uh, obviously keeping the interest rate uh, as low as you can get it that's, that's reasonable, uh, a reasonable deposit, yep. um, a reasonable balloon, and stay well away from unregulated agreements uh, because in, of the, in because of the penalties. In certain instances, there's some non-regulated agreements where the lenders charge a regulated settlement penalty, but again, the onus is just on the broker that, that you're dealing with to make sure that they're advising you correctly on okay. the exit penalties. So Mike, always some cute confusion here. Can you tell us what is the difference between uh, PCP and HP with a balloon? Only one main difference between the two products. At the end of the contract on a PCP agreement, the customer has the right to hand the car back if the car is not worth that final value, which is also called a guaranteed future value. On a HP with a balloon, that is the responsibility of the customer to effectively pay, pay that balloon figure. That could be done by way of them settling it off or ultimately we facilitating with a, um, with a, with a refinance. Okay, so PCP, guaranteed future value, um, uh, where at the end of their term they hand a, hand a car back, um, and are they able to refinance that balloon if they want to? Yeah, yeah. So they can pay yeah. the balloon off and keep the car, they can refinance it, they can pilot exchange the car, or if they just want to move on they can, they yeah, can yeah. basically hand the car back. Yeah, uh, um, yeah they can. So subject to there's mileage parameters, as long as, and if they have exceeded the agreed anticipated annual mileage, there's a mileage charge um, that, uh, that, that they will need to pay. So this is, this is set at the, the beginning of the term, it whether is, they're yeah. going to do 6,000 yeah, yeah. or 10,000 per yeah. annum. Uh, and with PCP, is there, is there, as you get higher up in the value of cars, is there limitations to what, what lenders yeah, will do the, PCP? The, what, what tends to happen is the, um, the sort of further up the food chain that you get with these, with these supercars, there's less lenders, um, very few that will do a guaranteed future value. But again, th there is instances, we, we've had it um, this week where clients um, bought um, a new Lamborghini and Lamborghini have basically set a residual so high, an inflated residual, just to move a car. Um, and in that instance, we've had a look at the product that the customer's been offered. And because that residual is a guaranteed future value, and it's actually more than what we would do on a HP with a balloon, we would actually say to the customer, that is a better product. So for that specific customer, he's better off funding it with Lamborghini. Okay, so if, if a manufacturer is doing some, uh, some special finance deals just to move their vehicles, um, and you would advise the customer to go down that route, even though it's not with you, if you think that's the best route for them? Yeah, pretty much. Okay, right. yeah. and then with the uh, HP with the balloon, uh, again, it comes down to, to avoid negative equity, you want to get that deposit, uh, a reasonable deposit in the car, keep the balloon low, and then at the end of that agreement, because uh, it's not a guaranteed future value, you want to not have negative equity yeah, in the car, correct, have equity yeah. so you can uh, polish change it again or refinance yeah. the balloon on that car. Yeah, correct, yeah. So what is the maximum age Elevate Finance would go to to finance a car? For example, here we've got a 35 year old um, 911 Turbo, flat nose, one of only 50 uh, factory built right hand drive cars. Mm. Clearly a good investment for the future and yeah, appreciating yeah. asset. If I wanted to buy this car and I came to you to finance it, how would you facilitate that? Yeah, the few things that we would just consider um, and look at when it comes to, to funding this type of car. Uh, first is looking at the history of the car. Uh, so it's sort of provenance, where, where, where it's come from. Um, the other sort of key thing that you mentioned there was the, where do we see it, one of 50. Um, when it's a one of a certain amount of cars that have, have been produced. A limited run, it, yeah. A, a, a limited run, yes. T sort of talking to the lender, um, it, it just makes it easier for them to sort of uh, gauge what the interest would be. The, the only sort of thing to sort of consider on, on, on the classics is just the deposit parameter that normally tends to be required. So where, whereas on your volume cars that are current cars, we can probably look at a 10% deposit on, on this sort of car, you're probably talking around about 15% as being the, the, the minimum deposit that a, yeah. a, a lender would look for. But again, because the, these are very much collectible, uh, there, there would be lenders that would that would have an appetite to fund them and they would have an appetite to put a balloon on the car as well because it because it's special okay so you treat each car uh, on an individual basis basically yeah. so for yeah, example yeah. this you take its mileage into account it's 22,000 miles yeah it's one of any 50 factory built cars um, so it has a, it has a wonderful uh, provenance behind it you look at all of that but then we look at a, a greater deposit yeah uh, as well yeah, yeah. Um, 
but it's definitely something that Elevate Finance can, um, can happily do. 100%, 100% yeah, 100%. So Mike, I've purchased a car on finance, not necessarily this car, any of the cars that we've, we've discussed here. If I wanted to make overpayments or pay off my finance early, could I do so without any penalties? Yeah, again, this is a question that we get asked on quite a regular basis. You can make overpayments. Uh, isn't any penalties um, in regards to you making overpayments? All that would happen is the finance company would do what's called a reschedule within seven days. So ultimately your monthly payments would come down uh, and ultimately the amount of interest that you pay back on the loan would be uh, re reduced as well on the basis that you make over payments, but, but yes you can. If you want to settle the loan off in full, on a regulated agreement, most lenders say it's a one month interest penalty, it's actually nearer two, so it's 58 days interest that you would pay if you're settling off a regulated mm -hmm. agreement early, and you can do that at any point in the, in the agreement. Okay. So I'm sometimes asked the question, if I take finance out of the car, do I actually own the car? We do get this question raised from time to time. And my, my view is that if I look at myself as an individual, I'm a homeowner, but I have a mortgage um, on my house. And ultimately, if you're taking finance out on a, on a car, I see it as being sort of uh, no different, that, that the car is yours but ultimately the lender that's involved in helping facilitate the funding also has an, a, an interest in the vehicle, no different to sort of myself, class myself as a homeowner, but having a mortgage on my property. So the, does yeah, that? Yeah, it does make sense. So the lender for the car has a charge on the car the same as your mortgage company has a charge in your house. Uh, um, correct, but yep. the invoice for purchasing the car is in your name. Yep. Uh, the V5 is in, in your name. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yep. so it's so just for all intents and purposes, I would be able to be the registered keeper of the car, yeah. 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 yeah, so it's just a charge on the car, the same as uh, a charge on your house. So it's no different to having a mortgage, just a lot, a lot uh, um, a shorter period, for a lot more fun. Yeah, <laughs> correct. Yeah. <laughs> So I've bought my dream supercar, whether it be the £240,000 812 Superfast here or the Lamborghini Aventador here at 184,995. Um, I'm enjoying my supercar, an unfortunate incident occurs, the car gets written off. Where do I stand from a finance point of view? So in the first instance, you would contact the finance company to get a settlement figure on your car. You would contact the insurer to basically give you an indication on what ultimately the car, the car is worth. Hopefully you're going to be in a position where you've got positive equity, which we, um, we touched on earlier. We do have a product that's available to us uh, that basically would take you, in the event that the car's written off or stolen, it would take you back to the original invoice price of the car. So you're two years into the, into the agreement, you've paid X amount of payments, it'll basically top you back up to the 184995. As far as the process works, as and when that, that, the write-off um, occurs, you would just basically come directly to us and then we would lead to liaise with uh, the provider of the asset protection. They would negotiate with your insurer and then ultimately you would uh, then receive a check which takes you back to the 184995. Okay, so with asset protection, um, basically you take the pain away from the customer. So you'll deal with the whole thing, you'll deal with their insurance company, and ultimately, if the insurance company for this car, for example, and he said, okay, we're gonna to, to pay 100,000 uh, pounds as a payout for it, with the asset finance, that would cover that other 84,995, and you'd basically be able to get all your money back to start again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, and the yeah. finance gets paid off. Yeah, it's, so, it's paid to, um, the maximum payout is 50K. Mm -hmm. So the, the most that we, the, the insurer would uh, would pay would be 50k and it's the insurer that would sort of look after that process so once the car's actually written off we would basically put you in touch with um, the insurer and they would liaise with the um, your insurance provider mm. to uh, negotiate what market value on the car was. So again, it's even more important if you don't take the asset finance, it's even more important to make sure you, again, you've got that big deposit, yeah, yeah. that reasonable balloon, yeah. to make sure that if any unfortunate accident does occur, you don't get yourself caught out in any negative equity, yeah. finding yourself having to pay an insurance company out of your own yeah. pocket. Yeah, 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 definitely. So balloons. How do the finance companies calculate their balloons? Um, for example, here we've got a uh, 911 GT2 RS, uh, a car that commands a, a premium over list price and always remains to do so, and also a car that does move with the markets, being uh, an investment car and something as special as it is. So how will the finance company calculate a balloon on something like this? If, if we go back to when we were talking about the, uh, the, the, the Porsche and 
the finance company actually understanding um, the car. This is a great example of a car which a lot of the finance houses just, just sort of don't understand. Again, we, we funded GD2 RSs um, in the past, so I could give you an indication that realistically cars, 325 grand, um, if we were looking to put together a profile on a four-year deal, um, I would be sort of really pushing to set the balloon on that car at probably 250 mm -hmm. after four years, um, just purely and simply based on the the values of these cars and what we what we've done historically with uh, with the lenders and there would be an appetite to do a balloon on that all day long okay That's so again on an individual basis look at the car understand the car yeah and as a broker elevate knowing the right lender to go to for this car i think again we've got we tend to have a lot of internal data on how many of these cars have been um on the market what they've been advertised for as far as screen price. We don't know the transaction price, but we've got a, a sort of pretty good indication. You've sort of tracked the market. Yeah, 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 we've sort of tracked the market. So we can give, um, with assurance, a lender uh, a steer in regards sort of um, how strong these cars sort of um, hold the money. And a lot of the time they do put on us on what we say. So I think we've covered now most aspects of financing cars. So I found the car I want at a dealer. What's the next process I need to go through Evaluate Finance to get finance on that car? So you would give us a call uh, on the basis that if it's a dealer that we currently have terms with, we can obviously just sort of run through the process directly with you as far as taking, taking your information, going through that interview type process. We would then send that through to um, the lender. We've got different service level agreements dependent on, on the lender. So with, with some of the, the, the volume lenders, our turnaround time um, normally runs at around about two hours. At the moment, because of the amount of influx of business that's coming through, it, it's probably a little bit longer than that, mm. um, just based on the amount of customers that uh, are looking for, for funding. So I'd probably set that nearer three hours. With an asset funder, it's probably nearer 24 to 48 hours, uh, especially on the, on the sort of more um, classic Type, type cars, it will take a little so bit. So approval is varied long. depending on the products you're, you're, you're going for with, yeah. with the lender. Yeah. But again, as we spoke about earlier, it's a case of you'll talk to the customer, have a little interview with them, qualify them on what their needs are, yeah. you'll know what lender to go to, and it can be somewhere between three, 24, 36 hours to, yeah, yeah. to, to, to get the yeah, result yeah. on the funding. Yeah. Well, what about if I, um, I bought a car uh, or I found a car I wanted to buy, but it wasn't with a dealer. It was, it was, um, it was uh, being sold privately, and I come to you wanting to fund it. We do get involved in funding um, private purchases. Um, I'm not particularly that comfortable in, in doing them. The main reason being, if a customer buys a car from you and I'm funding it, I know if there's an issue with that car, you're going to put it right, and I can come as back a dealer. to you. As, as, a as, dealer. A, as a dealer? Yeah. If a customer's buying a car from a private man, and there's an issue with that car, where, where do I go? There is and, no right. Exactly yeah, that. yeah, and that's, yeah, if you buy that, a car that privately, is, yeah, yeah. The so moment you've driven off the drive, that's you, yeah. yeah. You, so, you, so ultimately, we we would take a view if it's a private sale, if the car's within manufacturer's warranty, that would have a have a bearing. If it's an existing customer of ours, um, again, it would have a bearing. But sort of personally, I would rather not get involved in a in a private sale if I, if I possibly can, just on the basis that if there's any comeback, I know with the, with the dealer. I can go back to the dealer if there's a fault with the car. Am, am I right in saying as well there's a lot of lenders that won't lend if you're buying a car privately purely on that uh, basis? 100%, 100%. Because of the vulnerability there's a, there's a you've lot, got. There's a, a lot fewer um, yeah. lenders out there. Um, probably add them on one hand. Okay. The lenders that will, will get involved if it's a if And it's the ones that won't is because of the vulnerability of not buying from a dealer. Because exactly. Of the, the, exactly. The back because it's, the it's, not tri it's not ultimately a tripartite agreement. Yeah. So Mike, thanks for coming down to Premier GT today. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you here. Um, I hope myself and the uh, uh, members and our friends over at Four Marks weren't too tough on you with the questions. I think it's been pretty, pretty painless, to be honest, compared to what I was expecting. Yeah. So well, I think yeah, we, yeah, yeah, pretty, pretty hope, painless. Hopefully cleared up some very muddy waters where it comes I to hope finance, so. and it's it's been informative to to you all. Um, just a couple of um, fun questions I've got for you to end here, so uh, which might be of interest to everyone. What is the most uh, expensive car you ever funded? Do you just want to know what type of car it is, yeah? Yeah, what the car yeah, is, yeah. yeah what the, car, the car was a La Aperta. Yeah, that's probably the most expensive one that we've funded to date. Yeah. And um, what's, uh, what's the biggest balance you've ever funded? 
Uh, our biggest balance to date was 3.45 million. Wow. Well, okay. That's the biggest balance we've done up to now. And what's the biggest uh, monthly payment you've ever seen for a car you funded? The biggest monthly payment off the top of my head, 32 and a half grand a month. A month? A month is the wow. biggest monthly that we've done. <laughs> and yeah. out of up, up, up to now, up to now. Up to now, okay. Yeah. And out of all the cars you've uh, funded over the years, what would be your most favorite car? The fa favorite for me yeah. um, would be the first Ferrari Enzo um, that uh, we got involved in funding. Because it, it was quite, at an early stage, um, we were still quite a, a youngish company um, at the time. And to be involved in facilitating um, a purchase of the car that was effectively named after the man mm. um, it was just it was a it was a really good buzz fun, of uh, fun on that car still one of my favorite cars yeah. and again the values of those over the last sort of um, the last few years I think the, f the first one um, I say without sort of breaking any confidence is that it would have been sub a million um, as far as uh, the, uh, the the value of a car of the car um, and the, la the, the, the last one we did, which would have been sort of um, upwards of 2.4. Mm. So again, some of some of these cars, as, as you know yourself, have just gone have just gone pretty crazy. Yeah, again, another yeah. great investment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Okay, well, it's Most been great. Definitely. I hope it's been informative for everybody. Um, that's uh, uh, thank you very much. Thanks, yeah. Mike. No, thank you, thank you for your hospitality. Cheers. Cheers. See you, mate.